Welcome to the Santa's Friends PC, and today we're going to be talking about protecting your civil rights when interacting with the police. This presentation will be um, narrated by Eric Santa's Esquire, the owner and president of the Santa's Firm PC. The purpose of the presentation. The primary purpose of this PowerPoint presentation is to raise awareness with respect to your civil rights if you interact with the police during the course of law enforcement activities such as traffic enforcement, car stops, street encounters, stop and frisk, search and seizures, etc. But please note, these are very, and I mean very general guidelines. This PowerPoint presentation is not intended to convey specific legal advice or create an attorney-client privilege with the Santa's firm PC or its agents. Important points to remember. Under no circumstances should you fight back or resist arrest. Although difficult, please remember to try and remain calm. Remember, you have the absolute constitutional right to remain silent. Use it. Remember, under no circumstances should you request an officer's name or badge number. Absolutely, under no circumstances should you fight back or resist arrest. Engaging in such actions will only exacerbate the problem. Fighting back will likely result in avoidable injuries to yourself, bystanders, the police, and lead to criminal charges. Remember, in most jurisdictions, resisting arrest is a crime. The prosecutor may obtain a conviction even if the underlying arrest is illegal. Although difficult, please remember to try and remain calm. Police interactions can be quite unnerving, but it's important to remember the goal is to complete this interaction in a safe manner. Please remember, generally comply. Of course, this is with a caveat. Then, grieve later. Remember to make mental notes of the time, manner, and location of the interaction, including descriptions of the police, equipment, vehicles, etc. Remember, you have the absolute constitutional right to remain silent. Use it. Under the Fifth Amendment of the United States Constitution, it protects criminal defendants from having to testify if they may incriminate themselves through the testimony. A witness may plead the Fifth and not answer if the witness believes answering a question may be self-incriminating. Rule of thumb, always, and I mean always, remain silent. Request to consult with a criminal defense lawyer. The only information you should give the police is your pedigree information, such as your name, your date of birth, and the address. And a phone number where you can reach a parent or guardian if you're a minor, or a, a competent adult that can carry out your legal affairs if obviously you're an adult. Remember, despite what you believe, you cannot, and I stress this, you cannot talk yourself out of an arrest. Your words will be used against you as an admission of guilt. Remember, under no circumstances, request the officer's name or badge number. Remember, requesting this information or threatening to sue the officers undoubtedly leads to the majority of false arrests. And I'm commenting on this specifically for this reason, because I've seen other people say, tell the officer what you know and explain the law and all this other stuff. What they don't understand is there's going to be a consequence to that most of the time, which is going to lead to a false arrest. Listen to the advice and stay quiet. Don't ask the officer's name or badge number. You can always find that information out later. Remember, there is absolutely no need to tele telegraph your legal intentions. It's more important to make a mental note of the time, manner, and location of the police interaction, description of the officer, uniform or plain clothes, color of shield, Mark the unmarked vehicle, etc. There are three levels of police inquiry when they have interactions with the public. One is a common law right of inquiry. This inquiry is non custodial in nature. The officer may ask general questions about your conduct, such as how are you doing. The questioning and answers or lack thereof may, may increase the level of inquiry. The second level of inquiry is called reasonable suspicion 
also known as stop and question. This inquiry may, and I mean may, be custodial for a brief period of time. The officer may use physical force depending upon the circumstances. It's generally only limited to, to police officers within their geographical area of employment, although some states and some statutes allow peace officers to perform the same duties, but it's very limited in scope. The third level inquiry is probable cause, also known as an arrest. This inquiry is custodial in nature. Generally, the officer may arrest for crimes such as felonies or misdemeanors in or out of their presence, violations only in their presence. And in some circumstances, depend on the state and the venue, some statutes may allow certain violations the officers to place uh, an individual under arrest outside their presence, but those are generally limited to general uh, domestic violence type scenarios. Important amendments to the United States Constitution relevant to police interactions. The Bill of Rights became the first 10 amendments to the United States Constitution and contained guarantees of essential rights and liberties omitted in the drafting of the original document. In particular, we will focus on the First Amendment, Fourth Amendment, and the Fifth Amendment. The First Amendment. The First Amendment guarantees freedoms concerning religion, expression, assembly, and the right to petition. Other than the Fourth and Fifth Amendments, this amendment is a source of most police interactions and civil litigation. Generally, the police may, can impose time, manner, and location restrictions. However, those restrictions must pass the strict scrutiny standard. Otherwise, they will be deemed unconstitutional. And to give you an example how that occurred, that happened in the, uh, the Ferguson uh, protests when the, uh, as a result of the Michael Brown shooting. And the court ruled that they were unconstitutional in the time, manner, and location restrictions by saying that people couldn't protest except for a certain time of the day. It's important to note, generally, activities under the cloak of the First Amendment, however unpopular, distasteful, or offensive, are protected. The Fourth Amendment. The Fourth Amendment enforces the notion that each person is entitled to be secure in his or her person, home, property, and a person again, obviously, from unreasonable searches and seizures by the government. There are eight exceptions to the Fourth Amendment search warrant requirement. Search incidental to lawful arrest, the plain view doctrine, auto exception, consent, emergency exception, stop question and frisk, hot pursuit, and the inventory search. Search incidental to lawful arrest. Search incidental to a lawful arrest is an exception to the Fourth Amendment search warrant requirement that allows an officer to perform a warrantless search of a person under arrest in the grabbable area near the arrested person. This is also referred to as a safety search. The primary goal is to ensure officer safety not to search and seize contraband or other instrumentalities of a crime. The officer may search and seize contraband or other instrumentalities of a crime in the interest of the officer's safety, the prevention of escape, and the destruction of evidence. The Plain View Doctrine. The Plain View Doctrine is an exception to the Fourth Amendment search warrant requirement that allows a per an officer to perform a warrantless search and seizure of a person, place, or thing if there is immediately recognizable contraband or other instrumentalities of a crime in his or her presence, in their view. The officer's observation must be lawful from an area he or she was authorized to be in. The officer's observation must be inadvertent. Open view, also known as the open fields doctrine, is a variation of the plain view doctrine. However, there is no expectation of privacy. And the easiest example I can give you that makes sense is uh, you have open view or open fields doctrine in a park, a big open baseball field that, you know, you don't have expectation of privacy in, obviously, because it's in a public area. The auto exception. The auto exception is an exception to the Fourth Amendment search warrant requirement that allows an officer to perform a warrantless search and seizure of a vehicle or its contents because it may be impractical to obtain a search warrant due to the vehicle's mobility. Increasing the likelihood undue delay may result in a destruction of contraband or other instrumentalities of a crime.
consent. Consent is an exception to the Fourth Amendment search warrant requirement that allows an officer to perform a warrantless search and seizure of a person, place, or thing if the person, owner, or authorized agent of the person, place, or thing voluntarily consents to the search. There is no doubt voluntariness will be vigorously challenged by the criminal defense lawyer and the court. Emergency exception. The emergency exception is an exception to the Fourth Amendment search warrant requirement that allows an officer to perform a warrantless search and seizure of a person, place, or thing if there is immediately recognizable contraband or other instrumentalities of a crime in his or her view while handling an emergency condition. Stop, question, and frisk. The stop, question, and frisk doctrine is an exception to the, 14th, to the Fourth Amendment search warrant requirement that allows an officer to perform a warrantless search and seizure of a person, generally when an officer operating within his or her geographical area of employment reasonably suspects a person is committing, has committed, or about to commit a crime. The officer may use physical force to stop, question, and frisk the person. The stop is temporary for a reasonable time to complete an investigation. The important notes about stop, question, and frisk in particular. And generally, stop, question, and frisk can be used in crimes, felonies, and misdemeanors. In the state of New York, that's Criminal Procedure Law 14050, which allows stop, question, and frisk for any felony and or a misdemeanor defined in the penal law. It does not allow for stop and question scenarios for violations such as disorderly conduct. Another important thing to remember about stop and frisk, officers may use physical force, and that means physical force. They can grab you. They may be able to use a gun, which is another uh, form of physical force, or even use an ass baton um, to stop and question and frisk the person. The stop is going to be temporary in nature, and the courts have viewed that to be as long as two hours, depending on the scenario. Could be Most of these encounters are five minutes or so, but they could be as long as two hours if you have an extreme example I'll give you is a person um, has been stabbed and now they're trying to ascertain who did it and they have an idea this person may have done it. So the investigation for a stop and frisk take a little bit longer than a normal street encounter, which should be around five minutes or so. Um, in that case, not only can they stop you, they can make, uh, take you from the scene and bring you to where the injured person is under that very limited circumstance. Um, because of this, uh, the nature of the crime that they're investigating. In most stop and frisk scenarios, the stop is performed in the area and the, the person who stopped remains in the area. You don't move the person from the area to conduct your investigation. Hot pursuit. The hot pursuit doctrine is an exception to the Fourth Amendment search warrant requirement that allows an officer to perform a warrantless search and seizure of a person being pursued in hot pursuit even in private areas otherwise protected under the Fourth Amendment. The purpose is to ensure officers have the legal latitude to arrest persons accused of committing crimes who pose a danger to the community. Generally, officers may pursue persons into joint jurisdictions, including states and countries. Most jurisdictions limit an officer's legal authority to pursue persons accused of traffic infractions or, or other low-level Nonviolent offenses. Inventory. The inventory search is an exception to the Fourth Amendment search warrant requirement that allows an officer to perform a search and seizure of a person's property. The primary purpose is to safeguard a person's property. However, if during a search and seizure, an officer immediately recognizes contraband or other instrumentalities of a crime, such articles may be legally seized and used against a person in a subsequent criminal prosecution. Fifth Amendment. Under the Fifth Amendment of the United States Constitution, it protects criminal defendants from having to testify if they incriminate themselves through the testimony. A witness may plead the Fifth and not answer if the witness believes answering a question may be self-incriminating. Rule of thumb. Always remain silent. Request to consult with a criminal defense lawyer. 
Remember, despite what you believe, you cannot talk yourself out of an arrest. Your words will be used against you as an admission of guilt. Three methods to address police misconduct. File civil complaints with the agency, Internal Affairs Bureau, Officer of Professional Responsibility, Civilian Complaint Review Board, or variation thereof. File criminal complaints with the local, state, and or federal prosecutor. File civil complaints or civil claims in an administrative forum, state, and or federal court. Internal complaints. Internal complaints are handled by the Internal Affairs Bureau or sometimes referred to as the Office of Professional Responsibility. Civilian Complaint Review Board, as well as disciplinary charges, which can be verbal or written warnings, more formal charges resulting in loss of vacation time, a change in duty status, such as full unrestricted duty to administrative, modify, or restricted duty. Formal disciplinary charges could lead the accused officer with being served with charges or disciplinary charges, which may result in significant loss of vacation, suspension, probation, termination, or any combination thereof. The primary purpose is civil in nature. In other words, the goal is to seek an internal resolution with the police agency regarding your complaints and generally will not result in criminal charges. Although these matters can be filed and handled in conjunction with a criminal complaint. The process is generally free but tends to take a long time. The process is secretive and can be very frustrating to the complainant. The process generally will not result in a fining against the officer. Your cooperation is essential in order to create the best opportunity for seeking justice. Criminal complaints. Criminal complaints are handled by the Internal Affairs Bureau or sometimes referred to as the Office of Professional Responsibility. Criminal complaints are also handled by the Federal Bureau of Investigation, Local Prosecutor's Office, State Prosecutor's Office, and or the United States Attorney's Office. The primary purpose is criminal in nature. In other words, the goal is to seek a criminal conviction and impose a jail sentence. The resolution begins and ends with the prosecutor's office who enjoys essentially absolute discretion and determine whether or not officers will be prosecuted. The process is generally free but tends to take a long time. The process is secretive and can be very frustrating to the complainant. The process generally will not result in criminal charges being filed against the officer. Your cooperation is essential in order to create the best opportunity for seeking justice. Civil litigation. Generally, to protect certain legal claims, there must be an administrative filing with the government agency before filing a lawsuit, otherwise the lawsuit may be dismissed. Generally, depending upon the legal claims, the state court may be a preferred venue and have concurrent jurisdiction over claims filed under the Civil Rights Act of 1866 and 1871, also known as 42 U.S.C. 1981, which was drafted in response to the uh, abolishment of slavery, as well as 1983, which deals with state actions of abuse of state authority, and 1985, which is also known as the Ku Klux Klan Act, which allowed uh, claimants or plaintiffs to sue private entities for racial discrimination. Generally, upon the legal claims, depending upon the legal claims, federal court may be a preferred venue and through a supplemental jurisdiction authority can resolve common law and other state law claims. The primary purpose is civil in nature. In other words, the goal is to seek a civil remedy. Civil remedies can be money damages and or equitable. In other words, you want something done. The resolution begins and ends with you, known as a claimant, petitioner, or plaintiff, depending upon the legal venue. The process is generally very costly, and I can't stress that enough, very costly and tends to take a long time. The process generally will not result in a civil fine because of deference shown to the officers and the defense of qualified immunity. Your cooperation and persistence are essential in order to create the best opportunity for seeking justice. About Eric Sanders, Esquire, owner and president of the Sanders Firm PC. Eric is an active member of several legal professional organizations, including the National Employment Lawyers Association, National Employment Lawyers Association, New York Chapter, American Bar Association, 
New York State Bar Association, and American Bar American Association for Justice. He has also served as general counsel to the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives, New York Chapter. As a retired police officer, he holds memberships with several professional law enforcement organizations, including the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives, Noble, and the Fraternal Order of Police. Eric earned a bachelor's degree from Adelphi University and graduated from the St. John's University School of Law. He holds a license to practice law in the New York State Courts as well as the federal courts in the United States District Courts for the Eastern, Northern, and Southern Districts of New York. He has appeared before the Equal Opportunity Commission, New York State Division of Human Rights, NYPD Trial Room, New York City Officer Administrative Trials and Hearings, as well as other related proceedings. In 2011, Eric received a You Can Go to College Committee Foundation Humanitarian Award. Eric is available to speak about the law, specifically individual civil rights as well as other areas. Recently, he appeared as a panelist for a legal symposium hosted by the St. John's University School of Law's Journal for Civil Rights and Economic Development. At the symposium, which was entitled Criminal Justice in the 21st Century, the Challenge to Protect Individual Freedoms, Civil Rights, and Our Safety, he discussed racial profiling, police accountability, and individual rights. About the Santa's Firm PC. The Santa Firm PC offer those in the New York City area legal services related to and connected to civil rights, civil service rights, criminal law, and discrimination. We firmly believe in everyone's individual rights that are described and guaranteed by the Constitution of the United States of America. We understand that our freedoms and liberties are sac sacrosanct and that they have been won in many and various hard fought battles. We are committed in every way to protect your civil rights. If you have any questions or comments about the content of the slideshow presentation or general inquiries of the Sands Firm PC, please feel free to contact us on the website at www.thesandersfirmpc.com, which is located on each and every one of these slides in this presentation. You can contact us via social media channels, or you can contact the New York office or the Yonkers office. This presentation as it was presented by Eric Sanders Esquire of the Sanders Firm PC, your voice for justice.